Right, thanks for coming to my talk, everybody. My name is Ethan. I'm CEO and founder of ReallyRecycle.com. Donate a coin for plastics. But I also have a second hat, and that is as a applied mathematician working in organizations or with organizations like the NHS or the United Nations to build and include models with climate variables in decision making. For example, things like social accounting matrices, as well as um, including climate change variables inside health economics. And I think that we know why we're all here. We are all ethical businesses. And of course, that's part of the wider point of sustainable development. The main problem, though, is that within sustainable development, there's a bit of an art, and that is trying to balance out these competing forces, especially where the organizations that you are building don't implement all of the SDGs. The risk around that is that these forces that you create collectively create holes which are not addressed as part of the wider activities that all organizations have. So for example, you might look at climate change at the expense of people, or you might look at sustainable um, production and consumption, but not really think about life in the oceans. And all of these create problems that have to be addressed by some other entity in that commerce space, or often not at all. Popular versions of this include the idea of donor economies. Here you have two forces. One of them is the ecological ceiling pushing down on the amount of stuff that humans can do, while the social foundation is also trying to draw from nature at exactly the same time, giving humanity these two boundaries to live within. So we don't breach planetary boundaries, but we also create enough good for our social foundations to flourish wherever they are. And this in itself tells us that maybe the demons that we identify within our movement, for example, the big oil companies or the banks or very large scale firms, the big techs, etc., aren't necessarily actually the bad guys we should be focusing on. Because the way I see it, we have another enemy that's even more problematic, and that is the silo. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about receptacles to store grain in an industrial setting or a somewhat mediocre uh, Netflix or Amazon Prime drama. I'm talking about the idea of silo thinking, where we ourselves have separated out features or behaviors of our society, whether that is economy or industry or whatever, into things, things that are independent of nature, that are independent of climate, that are even independent of each other. And in almost all those cases, our siloed nature, our need to break down and divide and conquer, has been disconnected with the system as a whole. And what this has done is leave gaps for the bad, if you like, to flourish, to grow and to damage. Probably the most obvious one is the idea of GHG scopes. If you think about it, there is no organization anywhere in the world that or emits only scope 2 emissions. It's actually impossible. You can't, cannot create an organization like that. Because you haven't got an organization, you haven't got a function, you haven't got a, a business. And our quantification ideas, if you like, have allowed us to separate out scope 2 into this fictional thing independent of other emissions. So our decision making is now misaligned from what nature needs. And this also extends the idea of borders. Jet streamers don't need passports. Fish don't need passports. The idea of national borders is completely arbitrary. It's what we have created as humans. And in the case of the damage that we're causing, as well as responsibility for fixing that, fixing that damage, we have this perceived idea that country is the thing that matters. It doesn't. It's humanity in general. You cannot decide that actually... The USA is good and China is bad when it comes down to things like emissions. Because while the country's level of emissions might seem quite sort of similar, when you start breaking it down and looking at it on a per capita basis, the arguments are also somewhat arbitrary. Every year at COP, the big two, if you like, economic superpowers battle it out to basically reject the idea that they're the biggest emitters when in fact there is only one true answer. And this is because of the way we've siloed away the idea of a national border within the um, emissions landscape. If you look at cities as well, by siloing people into cities and looking at delivering industrial capability only within cities, what we get is, yeah, sure, 
an economy of scale and financial options. But we, what we also see is the level of plastic waste and global emissions are 50% more for people living in cities versus those living in more rural areas. And part of that is because of the level of poverty that exists elsewhere, but also because the economies of scale make it possible to create that level of waste in those spaces. The idea of transportation. It's a big focus in the public sector at the moment. Between 1990 and 2020, a gap of 30 years, there have been 60% more cars on the road. Despite all that, the total emissions of cars and taxis has actually dropped. And the reason why is actually because of more efficient engines and better fuels. Despite the fact that the transportation footprint appears to be increasing some, on some measures, a massive increase in HGVs, that's lorries and trucks, and vans, as well as aviation. And that's obviously because people like to go on holiday, and they go on foreign holidays because it's cheaper to go on foreign holidays than domestic ones, but also internet shopping, home deliveries, all of that has become a mainstay of how life is lived and retail is done. We have choices in this process, drivers of some of the new behaviors, because they are, businesses will adapt to what customers want. And you can see here that ATVs and vans are a key part of that drive, that um, change in that time. But actually, when you think about it, waste Manufacturing and supply are really one system. Right? You then dispose of that stuff into the bins, which have a downstream market to them, ultimately resulting in only about 12% of the stuff that you put in your, in this case, plastic waste recycling bin, actually being turned into any form of downstream product. But that downstream product is often a feedstock. And much of that feedstock also gets disposed of. So much so that only about 0.7 to 1% of what you put in your bin becomes another product that is usable by an end consumer again. So this circularity is actually very, very, very small. The ratios just don't make you commercially viable across the board to do all of them. What we've also started to see is this supply chain itself being impacted. Some of the most obvious include doing three-point turns in the Suez Canal, but also climate change is starting to affect the factory's abilities to stay open. And this means even once you've cleared these backlogs, you still can't put anything on the, the container ships and then take them, shoot through the Suez Canal to then deliver to local economies. We're also seeing, starting to see the effects of war in the Red Sea and in the Middle East. And those disrupt supply chains quite significantly. Climate change is already having an effect. We must do something, if you like, to return, return and restore manufacturing sovereignty, remove the difficulties of having so many of these moving parts. I'm going to give you guys a question because this will be important for understanding the system level impacts of what is the actual emissions reduction if we reduce our manufacturing needs, i.e. the demand for manufacturing by half? Is it 3%, 12%, 18% or 21%? Pause the video if you want to play along. The answer is 21%. So even though we would effectively reduce the manufacturing portion to 12%, the overall reduction would be 21% compared to the original figure. And this is because nothing exists in isolation. Manufacturing doesn't exist in isolation. Anything that's manufactured is moved. Anything that's moved is stored. Anything that's stored is used. Anything that's used is disposed of. And that means if you remove that thing, you remove all of those other elements associated with it because those pieces, those retail items, those things that consumers use, you and I use, are part of a much wider supply chain. That supply chain actually has other impacts which we would not expect. I mean, healthcare is the only sector in any economy that not only has to deal with its own emissions, but also clean up the effects of every other one as well. The health service are now is starting to realize that actually the demand of its own supply chain causes itself 345 million pounds of extra respiratory treatment demand every single year. So if you reduce the amount you take from natural resource and reduce the transportation distances, you also get a very large co-benefit, if you like, of reducing the demand for respiratory treatment every single year. Because that respiratory treatment is also about 25% of the NHS's footprint, you start to reduce a big segment of your actual demand, which then makes your money go further. 
So let's ask, how do circulative microeconomies help in this? Well, to answer that question, we've got to look back at what a linear economy is and how conventional circular economies help. In a linear economy, we accumulate emissions from the moment the material is dug up to make a thing that we need as humans to the moment it's disposed of, and potentially beyond that. Before we get a product are the largest bulk of the emissions, but you can't destroy those emissions simply just by taking hold of it. They stay there. They're accumulated already. They're embodied in the product itself. You then use the product and then dispose of that product. And while the individual disposal might seem small, the reality is you're disposing not just, you're not just emitting while you dispose, you're also destroying the embodied emissions inside the product you've made. So if you think that you've got a very small segment of waste, the reality is your waste is probably the biggest part of your emissions footprint because it destroys all the other accumulated emissions across all the products that you've bought. The other problem we've got is that circular economies, which are meant to connect the waste disposal and the uh, inputs, the, the feedstock to uh, manufacture, maintaining the entirety of the transport emissions in your system. And that's a very big footprint, right? That means the lowest you can go with a regular circular economy is about halving any emissions footprint from the life cycle of any product. Only halving it. Because you still move it a long way. And sometimes you still store it. And all of that keeps that emissions level high. It's impossible, basically, to, to get to net zero by moving things about. Now, circular microeconomies help here because they remove that transportation footprint as well but also use low energy, low volume manufacturing in distributed centers so people only make what they need and you also transport it by foot or by cycle instead of by truck or by van, removing the miles from this process. Doing that ensures that your footprints can get to a level which you can manage very effectively even with questionable offset methods to transition towards a net zero position and indeed go carbon net negative. This is because the principle of the greatest emission savings being the ones you never emit in the first place takes hold throughout that circular microeconomic position, right? Because what circular microeconomies do is take all the individual segments together from all the individual sectors, removes what it doesn't need to use, combines those into a cradle-to-cradle -cradle system, reduces and optimizes that, clones that optimized place geographically, and then each one operates as if it's a cradle-to-cradle -cradle economy in its own right. And doing it this way reduces emissions about 96%. So by having mesh networks of these little circular microeconomies, one per district or maybe a few per district, you suddenly are able to create jobs, create manufacturing opportunities and products that you can sell. You also can use different types of transport infrastructure, for example, bike courier. And this also allows you to create new ways for communities to take pride and engage in that waste while actually creating or formalizing many of the economies that exist in the world's poorest regions. So in plastics, what we do, for example, at, at reallyrecycle.com is we capture waste in our IoT connected bins. We only collect when it's needed, thereby saving mileage and making better use of resources. And what we've collected is then reconstituted into a filament, which then refills our 3D print vending machines. And yes, I did say vending machines. That means when people need something, you walk up to the machine, you press a button, and it'll make it automatically. And that means you're only ever making what you actually need, which is different to conventional manufacturing because manufacturers have to make it in large bulks to make the setup costs cost-effective. Right? Because the cost to, to create an injection molded system is very, very, very high. Typically £150,000 before you even started to make a single item. So having ways of creating items or very small runs now stimulates economies which have traditionally had a very high barrier to entry and needed investment support. Now it democratizes. That means entire communities can create manufacturing and circular recycling services to rival those of the large conventional systems at a fraction of the cost. Within this process, you've also got to account for the fact that plastics degrade. They degrade in really weird ways compared to other materials. For example, the speed at which you heat it degrades it more or less. And you can only recycle some plastics a few times before it then becomes 
a useless commodity for a conventional circular economy. So a bottle-to-bottle -bottle system can only recycle once or twice before it then becomes impossible to recycle the bottle again. But our systems not only acknowledge that and dilute that degradation using a very robust mathematical model and formula to include newer plastics with older ones, what we also do is acknowledge that sometimes from an emissions perspective, from a systemic emissions perspective, a life cycle emissions perspective, it's actually better to downcycle the plastic but upcycle it into products in other industries. You might get your medicines in a bottle or you might get them in a blister pack, but that medicine, that plastic is very, very high quality. It's about the highest grade that you can get. But even, so it's so high that even once you've recycled it twice, you're still at a higher grade than some of the plastics that you use in commodity products like coat hooks or whatever else. While it is downcycling for the current sector, medicine, it's actually still upcycled relative to other sectors. Right? It's still a higher grade relative to other sectors. This then allows you to make locally what is traditionally made thousands of miles away. This allows you to offset or remove, more correctly, some of the 45 billion tons of CO2 in moving this plastic around and manufacturing this plastic in the first place. Also save on the health burden, democratizing the utility of the up to $30 trillion of currently wasted economic potential, which actually now everybody can take a share in. Take, for example, what we take what is basically laminate sheets, waste laminate sheets, and then turn them into reusable flip charts. So basically you can scan the QR code on the flip chart and then save them to your Dropbox and Google Drive. What we've done is we've taken that waste and upcycled it, and we're moving up the waste hierarchy and created a product that is usable in stationary spaces or meeting spaces or event spaces. Right? And we've added more to it. In this case, a tech platform. Properly think about waste in terms that are systemically optimal. So much so that a lot of the old terminology, things like downcycling, cease to be a thing because they're not a thing. In real terms, they aren't a thing. It's always about material and resource reuse. Right? When you only think about regular circular economies, the stricter circular economies, you actually increase the amount of emissions because you're losing the opportunity to save the emissions that you could do. If that makes sense. You're not avoiding the emissions that you could do. And in fact, you're generating potentially more wasteful products because you're then choosing at what point a product becomes waste, a recycled generation becomes waste. Okay? It has been tested most recently with the GMCA Foundation Economy Fund. So we captured about 1.4 tons during that. And we saved about 6 tons in emissions. We've generated about £23,000 in, whole, in uh, value from it, economic value from it, but also... Our circularity ratio is currently set at 135 to 1. Now, what this means is that our manufacturing compared to conventional recyclers means that for every one bin that we take and recycle, it takes 135 bins worth of stuff from conventional recyclers to make or to remanufacture the same mass of product. Right? Because most of that is actually burnt or exported and, and they lose that utility for the community. And that means that locally you're recycling more, you're reducing much more emissions and you're also creating economic value. And this has been repeated time and time and time again. And that's where you're now able to decentralize this, this concept of a circular or sustainable city microfactory, which then creates the products that that community needs on a regular basis. The fast moving stuff. And every community is different, right? If you're a large manufacturer, you often can't take the fidelity view, the kind of fine-grained view that each community has different needs and therefore needs different products. You have to let the retail organizations do that at the time. But now you combine retail and manufacturing into one. So now the community itself only manufactures what it actually needs and only sells what it actually needs and processes the waste, all of the waste, into products that it actually needs. There's no need to transport things a long way. And what this basically does is allows these circular microeconomic vessels to, to basically work together almost like the internet works. They can either work independently for each community or work in communities that can be also as arbitrarily defined. You could create communities for just education within that space. 
and they would utilize a network of these. You could create groups of what would be a good one, home improvement enthusiasts or new products for whatever reason. All of those create these potential distributed mesh networks, which then allow these communities to work across geographies together, much like the internet allows that now. And this is why we should never be thinking in silos. You should never be thinking in closed doors and borders and walls. We should always be thinking systemic, thinking you, thinking us. And that is my talk. Feel free to scan the QR code here and um, connect with me on LinkedIn and or other platforms. Take a look at our social media because we often show behind the scenes footage of what we're about. Or visit our website or contact us on uh, readerecycle.com. Thank you very much. It'd be great talking to you.